Thank you, Thomas. Thank you all for being here and uh, appreciate uh, the sentiments. The quantum pleasure principle, how objective reduction sparked the origin and evolution of life. And I'm combining the ideas of Sigmund Freud and Roger Penrose. So here's a question, seriously, which came first? Uh, uh, Dante addressed this a little bit. Which came first, consciousness or life? Most people probably uh, would say, number one, and this includes neuroscientists, uh, Western philosophers, that life preceded consciousness. Consciousness emerged from life. Uh, however, there's another possibility that, uh, uh, that uh, consciousness came first, and this is in panpsychism, uh, Eastern philosophy, spiritual approaches, Whitehead, and Penrose objective reduction, which I'll talk about in a little bit. According to this, consciousness preceded life, and life emerged from consciousness. So if we look at the uh, history of the universe, uh, uh, at least uh, the, the present eon, if, if uh, there may be uh, previous eons over here, uh, for the, uh, at least um, uh, up to the year 2000, uh, when did life uh, appear? So I use Bing to imp imply consciousness. So it could have been uh, fairly recently with tools and language and brains, and a lot of people think that only fairly recently with brains have we had consciousness. Uh, it could have been earlier in the uh, so-called Cambrian evolutionary explosion. This was a huge increase in evolution uh, 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 b uh, about 540 million years ago within uh, a brief uh, um, 10 million years right there, all the animal phyla developed in a very brief 10 million years. And the uh, fossils um, show these kind of spiny urchins, very similar to uh, Actinospherium that's still around today, this weird worm thing. Uh, this is a Suctorian, and I don't know what that guy's doing, but it looks like fun. Trilobites. Trilobites. Thank you. Um, so, and, and in fact, we know today that, uh, for example, the, uh, the actinospherium uh, here uh, has these spikes, and if we cross-section the spikes, we see there are these double helical arrays of microtubules. Each of these uh, round things is a microtubule in cross-section. And uh, similarly, the suctorian tentacles actually suck by rhythmic uh, contraction and expansion of these bands made of microtubules. So uh, microtubules go back at least, actually they go back uh, further than that, but uh, they, were, they were present at the beginning of this Cambrian evolutionary explosion. And I wrote a paper that uh, uh, the Cambrian evolutionary explosion might have precipitated, or that consciousness might have occurred because we had a critical number of microtubules. But I, th I think now it actually happened uh, earlier, although this would have been a very important uh, milestone in acceleration. So, um, it could have been earlier with eukaryotes, uh, the first uh, animal life. And uh, if you go back up here uh, to, according to Lynn Margulis Sagan, uh, uh, eukaryotes started when um, uh, symbiosis of mitochondria into prokaryotes and then spirochetes with flagella, with cytoskeletal microtubules invaded and gave the uh, organisms mobility so they could move around, compartmentalize, and eventually have mitosis and so forth. So that was another big step. Um, or maybe earlier, uh, first life, and actually I'll come back to that because I think that's where the answer is. Or possibly before the, uh, this eon, and Roger has this idea of uh, serial eons, and the Big Bang was just one of, one of many, but we're not going to talk about that today. But that raises the question, what is consciousness? Okay, we can argue when it happened, but what the heck is it? And uh, we're still pondering that question. And a clue comes from the measurement problem in quantum mechanics, where, for example, uh, a... A, uh, an atom, like a cesium atom, can be a wave and you know, multiple uh, possibilities uh, in superposition. It can be a wave, but, whoops, but, uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, let's talk about quantum mechanics and just briefly, um, the, um, that reality is kind of uh, in two realms, and Roger was talking about this, and we have the quantum world with quantum superposition, non-locality, wave-like, and small, of the classical localized, oh, everything's localized, particle-like, and consciousness, it seems, on the edge between the two. Whether consciousness causes collapse, which some people think, or collapse causes consciousness, it's on the boundary between the quantum and classical worlds. So a particle can exist as a wave of multiple possibilities, yet when measured or consciously observed, is seen as in a definite state and location as, as a particle. And uh, this is led to the idea that conscious observation collapses the wave function. 
And, uh, but first, the question is, how can something be in two or more states at once, superposition? And Roger accounted for this through Einstein's general relativity. And uh, Einstein's general relativity shown that, had shown that matter was equivalent to curvature in fundamental space-time geometry. For example, for large things like the sun, so the light from a distant star would be bent so we could see it on Earth. But Roger applied it to tiny things, to quantum particles, so that a quantum particle uh, here is actually a curvature in, in space-time. And he made these two-dimensional space-time sheets so he can put, put it on a piece of paper with one-dimensional space, one dimension of time. And this particle oscillating back and forth would be a, a different curvature, curvature back and forth. And then superposition would be uh, uh, separated curvature. So you have this curvature and that curvature and a part of the same particle in both locations. And this was a way to envision uh, quantum superposition and also, by the way, uh, emerge quantum, uh, quantum physics and general relativity, which was a neat trick in and of itself. And it turns out to involve consciousness. Now, if the separations were to continue, you can imagine you'd have multiple worlds. Each possibility branches off, and you have a whole new universe, the multiple worlds hypothesis. And a lot of people believe that. And then other people believe, as I said, that consciousness collapses the wave function. For example, uh, von Neumann, Wigner, Stapp, more recently uh, Chalmers and McQueen, and, and Kelvin's here somewhere, I think, and he'll be talking tomorrow. And uh, so here we have uh, uh, consciousness, uh, Bing means consciousness, uh, observing, causing this one to cease and this one to continue. So it's consciousness is causing collapse of the wave function, but it puts consciousness outside of science. It's kind of dualist. It doesn't explain what it is. Um, Roger said, however, that the superposition separations are unstable and will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction at an objective uh, threshold at time t equals h bar over e sub g. So here's the evolution of the Schrodinger equation. We get to time t equals h bar over e sub g, and this one ceases uh, spontaneously. Bing happens, a conscious moment happens, and this one continues. So there's a moment of proto-conscious experience, Bing, at time t equals h over g. And he talked about that uh, this morning. Uh, now these, these moments, these Bing moments in space-time uh, would be random, uh, assuming they're occurring in the environment, uh, proto and merely proto-conscious. Random, disconnected, no memory, no context. They would come and go, but they would have been present in the early universe all along. Um, could they have sparked the origin and evolution of life? And this is the idea in the paper that, that Dante read, um, that they did so. So life on Earth uh, apparently began in a primordial soup uh, proposed by the, in the 1920s by Oprin and Haldane, a simmering oily mix from which biomolecules emerged three to four billion years ago. And in the 1950s, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey at the University of Oregon simulated a primor primordial soup. They put all the ingredients in there that they, that they knew were, were there, uh, sparks for lightning, and let it cook for a while. And then they looked, and they found these amphipathic, bio amphipathic molecules, essentially biomolecules, with nonpolar aromatic rings, uh, as, as Dante was, was describing, these benzene rings with three extra electrons with a polar tail. So they're charged over here and uncharged, they're non, uh, non-polar over here. And this is basically the structure of dopamine, uh, a lot of uh, even psychedelics and, and psychoactive compounds. We'll come back to that. So uh, uh, these aromatic rings form these uh, electron clouds um, that, that uh, form uh, basically a, a volume of, of quantum non-locality, because this is the distributed uh, electrons that are smeared out over this volume, which is actually a pretty significant uh, uh, volume. Uh, so these rings, they share delocalized electrons, uh, and uh, they, they support quantum optical effects, including excitons, collective dipole oscillations, super radiance, and other things like that. Uh, and this is uh, all within biology in nonpolar regions that is uh, protected from the uh, from the uh, classical en environment. So in uh, Arad's, Arad's talk yesterday, he talked about uh, uh, fluorescence uh, lifetimes in, in tubulin and microtubules, uh, where he hits it with uh, UV light, and there's a period of, 
uh, tryptophan fluorescence lifetime decay where it stays in the excited state for a period of time and kind of bops from one, one level to another. And this is actually a quantum state of these multiple possibilities and then drops down. So it goes from a quantum state and collapses back uh, to a classical state. This is fluorescence and anesthetics uh, delayed this, this response. So we sh showed an effect with anesthetic on the quantum effect in microtubules. Um, uh, other examples of uh, uh, quantum effects in uh, organic uh, rings are from uh, Uyang and Aushalam from UC Santa Barbara back in 2003. They, they used quantum dots and connected the, the benzene rings, connected them by benzene rings and put a spin and uh, measured as a function of temperature. And everybody says that uh, uh, the brain's uh, biology is too warm, wet, and noisy, but they found that uh, this process of quantum spin transfer was increased by temperature. And uh, we also know that these uh, pi resonance rings uh, uh, induce, induce Van der Waals dipoles in, in, in another one. So they attract by, they're uncharged, uh, new, chemically neutral, but the electrons here repel the electrons here and they form dipoles. The dipoles then attract and they oscillate. So these benzene rings will oscillate in terahertz, which is actually in the, in the blue, uh, can, can be as high as the blue-green spectrum uh, in visible light. And uh, they can also form qubits, quantum bits, where um, uh, they can be in superposition, you know, pairs of them, superposition of both, both dipole states and oscillating back and forth. And this is the level that anesthesia works at. I don't have time to talk about that. But anesthetics bind and, and gum up the works. They block the dipole oscillations. Uh, they dampen the dipole oscillations by what are called literally dipole dispersion forces. So this would be the unconscious state. Uh, this would be the conscious state if these were part of a much larger system. And of course, the psychedelics all have these aromatic rings, and, and Dante mentioned the indole ring of uh, uh, D, uh, DMT, for example, and also uh, serotonin and, uh, and other psychedelics. Here's LSD, which has a more complex ring. So these have huge pi electron resonance clouds and tremendous opportunity for quantum effects. Now, uh, people say the brain is too warm, wet, and noisy for quantum effects. And to that, I say bullshit, part of my French, because uh, a lot of the brain is wet. And, and if, if you take a brain or a body and grind it up, imagine some of you don't like maybe, and, uh, and put it in test tubes in different solubility compartments, you find that it, the, it's very heterogeneous. You find different areas where different things may be, may be soluble. And as we go up this way, it gets more uh, uh, polar and water-like and soluble. If we go that way, it gets more oil-like, and this is where the aromatic rings are. And we know this is where anesthetics bind. So these, uh, the bings are where uh, anesthetics bind, therefore where consciousness is in an oil-like, and oil and water don't mix, the aromatic rings within the brain somewhere, and these are the, the benzene uh, rings. So uh, it's not warm, wet, and noisy. So if you take uh, amphipathic, uh, these amphipathic molecules that were detected in the primordial soup, uh, they will, uh, the, the, the nonpolar heads will attract each other by the van der Waals forces, and they group together, and the polar tails stick out, and these form what are called micelles, or were called micelles by Operin and Haldane, and these seem to be the progenitors of biological cells. And here's what a real <coughs> uh, micelle looks like. This is from Tumulus in, Vil in Lithuania, so it's a little bit more complex than the drawing I have, but... But the point is you can have these aromatic rings uh, sequestered and shielded from the aqueous environment inside the micelle or inside, inside proteins in general. So back in the primordial soup, let's go back to the uh, aromatic rings or the amphipathic molecules forming, oops, forming uh, micelles. And they're going to get together and if you leave them alone, they're going to eventually accumulate uh, enough superposition, uh, E sub G, to reach threshold for Roger's uh, mechanism, and we'll have a, a conscious moment at time t. This would involve a huge number of these things, but if you leave them alone and, the, and they were still in a, in a pond somewhere or something, you would eventually re, uh, reach this uh, threshold and have a conscious moment, and uh, a proto-conscious moment, I should say. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the, what would be happening at the level of space-time geometry. So qualia, or feelings of primitive OR events, would be random. But some would be positive, would be feel good, uh, would feel good. Occasionally, you'll get a, a, uh, a, 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 a pleasurable feeling would come out of this, and uh, maybe randomly. And uh, 
the suggestion is that uh, with pleasure as a feedback fitness function, uh, orienting pi resonance groups to self-organize in a particular way, life could then evolve to orchestrate and optimize OR-mediated pleasure. And I call this the quantum pleasure principle in the paper that, that Dante referred to, based on Freud's beyond the pleasure principle. And of course, we do, we do get beyond just pure pleasure into more uh, delayed gratification and, and altruism and stuff like that. But at the beginning, pleasure and avoidance of displeasure may have sparked the origin of life. And, uh, you know, Darwin is a pillar of science, and I'm not uh, uh, attacking Darwin. He actually talked a lot about consciousness, but he didn't have a mechanism for it, so he couldn't put it into uh, what's driving uh, evolution. Um, but the, the notion that life evolved uh, to promote gene survival, which is really Dawkins' idea, is an assumption. It doesn't really make any sense. Uh, if genes don't feel, why would, why would they have any motivation? I mean, what's the point? Uh, Dante mentioned quantum complexity, and maybe that's the case, but uh, I, I think uh, pleasure might be a, a better bet, uh, and one that at least I can understand better. And we know that in, uh, in laboratories, uh, uh, animal, rats and in mazes and everything is uh, behaviors driven by reward, pleasure avoiding pain. Even generally our behavior, we're here because we enjoy being in an intellectual environment or the weather is supposed to be nice, etc. Uh, remember there were no genes in the primordial soup. We went, you know, a couple billion years without genes, so how did that happen? And evolutionary theory ignores consciousness and feelings because they can't explain it. They don't have a mechanism for it. That's the main reason. So uh, the point is that I think that uh, feelings might be driving evolution. And this is also called the phenomenal argument in evolution. So they don't totally ignore it, they just mostly ignore it. So a couple other possibilities that if you take two aromatic rings, uh, they have two stable states. One is T-shape, uh, where uh, they're actually perpendicular and uh, at an angle like that, T-shaped, and the other is parallel displaced. And so it could be that uh, one of them, let's say T-shaped, is, uh, is sad and uh, the parallel displaced is, is happy. And Hartman, this reminds me of that paper that you and uh, Peter wrote about, uh, I think it was space time, but the same, same uh, sort of idea. The particular con configuration uh, can have pleasure when, when it collapses to one of these. So in fact, you can have a qubit of a uh, quantum bit of uh, a superposition state, which is the sandwich uh, where they're stacked on top. This is metast metastable and, and uh, could be superposition. And then it can, it can uh, collapse to either the T-shaped, the not so happy, and the, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> offset parallel, which is happy. And uh, that may be uh, kind of the, code, the, the qualia code. And if you get a protein like tubulin, which has 86 aromatic rings, and uh, therefore 86 uh, factorial interactions, you get a huge number of possible qualia interactions as shown by this array of emojis that I took from my phone. <clears throat> um, and uh, so briefly, uh, we applied this to the orca war theory to, to tubulin and microtubules. And here we see the aromatic rings, tryptophan, phenylalanine, this is tyrosine, or maybe it's backwards, a uh, typo there. And there's 86 aromatic rings. The red spheres are where anesthesia binds to block consciousness. And uh, these are arrayed in, uh, in pathways. For example, this pathway here, or it could be this pathway here, or this pathway here, uh, according to the, the microtubule lattice, so that we can have uh, topological qubits these are uh, dipole oscillations, quantum dipole oscillations that wrap around and extend mesoscopically and ma macroscopically. So you have a mesoscopic or macroscopic quantum state in the microtubule in, in, all of, in, in, in neurons, maybe all our cells. And uh, these would reach threshold. Uh, there would be many, many of them, uh, 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 10 to the 15th tubulins maybe, entangled, that would reach threshold for a conscious moment. At, uh, at, at 10 megahertz and have a conscious moment that corresponds with Bing in the uh, underlying space-time geometry. So this is the uh, essential feature of the orca war theory, and we approach the hard problem by saying that the qualia of a rose is actually its fundamental space-time uh, geometry curvature, not just three curvatures, but much more complex. So she gets the qualia of the rose because she's reproducing the, uh, the space-time curvature in her head, or maybe entangling with the, with the uh, space-time of the rose. And this is what I think uh, Ricardo Manzati was uh, trying to get to yesterday, or at least I think how, 
how we should approach it, that, that uh, the object out there is actually, we, we entangle with it, and that's, that's how we get the qualia. Uh, and then we have a series of these conscious moments, bing, 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 I think it uh, uh, actually uh, at 10 million times a second, and uh, that's too fast for cognition. Um, but based on Honorbaum's work, uh, he didn't show this slide, but this is from Honorbaum's work showing uh, basically um, uh, that here's a, a, a three scales, neuron, microtubule, tubulin, and uh, uh, applying AC and, and sweeping, sweeping the current, sweeping the frequency, you get these triplet of triplet patterns uh, at uh, terahertz, uh, gigahertz, megahertz, uh, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz, and this megahertz, kilohertz, and, and hertz. So you see these triplets of triplets every three orders of magnitude. And uh, <clears throat> this has given rise to what we call, what we call the, a multi-scale hierarchy for Orkawar, where we start from the neuron, and a lot of people have multi-scale hierarchies in the brain going upward to networks of neurons, networks of networks, and so forth. But if you go downward, you have 12 orders of magnitude from a, a neuron to networks of microtubules uh, in, in 1,000 hertz, then a microtubule at a, a megahertz, <coughs> excuse me, uh, uh, dipole arrays at a gigahertz, tubulin at terahertz, uh, uh, nuclear superposition at petahertz, and then uh, a, a big step down to the Planck scale uh, at, uh, at terahertz. So this is a, uh, a kind of a... a a scale-free uh, scale hierarchy that consciousness can occur in, and I, th I, I call it a, a quantum orchestra because I think the brain isn't a computer, it's more a quantum orchestra, and consciousness is more like um, uh, music in some sense. So um, we also can, can plot uh, whether, uh, how many tubulins uh, in a given organism, and uh, Rajneesh was talking about plants being conscious, and uh, so if you plot the number of tubulins, uh, our brains, we have about 10 to, the 20, 10 to the 20th tubulins, and if we used them all, we would be at a frequency of about, uh, what is that, uh, 10 to the 11th hertz. We're probably down here at about uh, 10 to the 7th hertz, um, uh, for other reasons, megahertz. A mouse, we get down here. Uh, cerebral organoids are about 10 to the 8th. C. elegans, about 10 to the 7th. A paramecium, about 1,000. And plant cells uh, might have uh, uh, a few, uh, 100 tubulins, and they would have a conscious moment maybe every few minutes, whereas we have 10 million per second. So uh, plants can be conscious, but at a much lower frequency, and I think that also applies to, uh, to uh, l uh, lesser uh, creatures and, and simple organisms. So um, our theory, and I'm, I didn't really go into it too much, um, but uh, the Orca War theory has more explanatory power, connection to biology, and experimental validation, for example, in inhibition of, uh, anesthetic inhibition of, of quantum effects in microtubules, as we heard yesterday, than all of the mainstream theories, uh, integrated information, uh, global workspace, higher order, uh, predictive coding, it's combined, because they, they really don't have any, uh, any of these, explanatory power, connection to biology, or experimental validation. They're all just kind of uh, wiring diagrams of information flow through the brain without saying whether it's axonal firing, synaptic transmission, defaptic fields, and genetic signal. It could be any number of things, or it could be at, the, uh, at a deeper level in the microtubules. So uh, uh, the, the predominance of these theories without uh, considering quantum, because they say it's too warm, wet, noisy, annoyed me sufficiently to organize this conference along with the Tampas. Thank you. So uh, back in the primordial soup, uh, anywhere else? Well, uh, Dante mentioned these polyaromatic hydrocar hydrocarbons that are uh, floating around in space, and uh, uh, they have all kinds of interesting shapes. Here's one of them. These could be like conscious beams or something, maybe. Proto memes, proto conscious memes. I'm not sure. Here's a particularly interesting one that was found uh, in a meteorite. There's there's a name for this. I, f I forget. Uh, what is it? Insoluble organic molecule. Whatever it is. But uh, I'd like to know what it's trying to tell us, if anything. And uh, uh, all the, the green you see is terahertz oscillations. The cosmic microwave background comes from these PAHs in interstellar dust. So maybe they, they floated onto Earth or came by an asteroid or a com, uh, meteorite 
or maybe, uh, or maybe they're actually uh, entangled and, 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 and uh, oscillating coherently uh, themselves. It could even be conscious in some way. I'm, who knows? Um, so in conclusion, let me say that consciousness is a fundamental process intrinsic to the universe. Uh, Penrose objective reduction, uh, that's the process, that's the intrinsic process, and which is a self-collapse of the quantum uh, wave function connected to space-time geometry and general relativity. I think to, to uh, approach the, the hard problem, you have to say it's fundamental in some way, and this is, ex we're specifying a particular way that uh, it is fundamental, and it also solves a number of other problems, uh, for example, the measurement problem and uh, reconciling quantum physics and general relativity. OR in the early universe prompted the origin of life has, and has driven its evolution. Uh, our theory, the ORCOR theory, suggests consciousness depends on quantum processes and microtubules inside uh, brain neurons, and it has, I claim, uh, more explanatory power, connection to biology, and supportive experimental evidence than the other theories combined. Thank you very much. Q&A. Thank you, Stuart. That was that was really amazing. You covered a lot there. So I'm going to ask I'm going to ask an obvious question. So if there is consciousness prior to life, uh, then obviously there's information at quantum level that before the Bing moment, any anything that's going to uh, do or or and beyond is already there. So would you also say that there is then intelligence and in, and the or maybe do we call it quantum intelligence? Is there intelligence as well as consciousness? I, I, I'm not, I get the question, I'm not going that far because, uh, because uh, I, I, you know, I'm already out pretty far on a limb. And <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just say that there's all these random proto-conscious events and whether they, they all communicate in something like cosmic conscious and consciousness or cosmic conscious intelligence, that's certainly possible. But I'll just uh, stand pat with what I've said. Hey, Stuart. Thank you so much for uh, organizing this conference. Uh, a brilliant talk. Uh, Thank such you. a nice uh, uh, coalescing of all your ideas. Um, going to the first point here about the self-collapse of the quantum wave function and the time constant related to that, does, does that time constant value, has it been actually calculated with physical constants, and does that correspond to pi resonance and, and the other physical structures? In other words, does, does the time constant itself predict uh, these uh, physical chemical activities, do you know? You mean from the uh, T equals H bar over yeah, E sub G? Yeah, exactly. Does well, that e time correspond to what's happening in the chemicals themselves? It's, it's, it, in principle, yes, it depends on how many. So. If, if uh, we calculate it for number of tubulins, uh -huh. and I think the quantum has actually happened in the pi electron resonance orbitals, and it starts with, uh, and, and this is something I've just come around to in the last couple of years, uh, quantum optical effects in the pi electron resonance. But uh, a critic uh, would, would jump and say, well, you need E sub G, uh, significant uh, gravitational self-energy of the mass pulled apart from itself, yep. and the electrons are so, uh, so light, they're not gonna do much. But the electron movement uh, uh, influences the nucleus very slightly. Not much, because it's like a soccer ball moving the Earth. But those values sort of fit with what, what we're talking about, is that right? For that... the number of tubulins. So yeah. okay. uh, we started out with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, T equals pretty long, like 40 hertz. But that, uh, that's a long time for decoherence and uh, not too many tubulins. So in 2014, we changed to uh, uh, a very, very short time like 10 megahertz, but then we had the issue of, well, that's too fast for cognition. But how you get around that, and Roger came up with this, I remember the phone call, and he said, he, he, he gave me the answer, I said, holy crap, that solves two problems at once. I, I don't cuss in front of him, but I, <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and that was uh, a negative resonance. I said, what's negative resonance? He said, well, you know, interference. So you have, all, you have these 10 megahertz oscillations, and because this is uh, a little bit in the weeds, but the microtubules, these guys know this. The microtubules and dendrites are in opposite polarity. So if they're oscillating at say 10 megahertz, but they're in the, they're in the uh, opposite uh, polarity and they, they're in the same 
membrane voltage, they're going to have slightly different frequencies. So they're going to have beat frequencies. So that gives rise to slower, so every three orders of magnitude, and that's how you get EEG. We predicted in 2014 that the EEG is, is, is uh, beat frequencies of microtubules. And uh, you know, neuroscientists didn't like that, but I haven't heard any uh, objection uh, or any better explanation for EEG. Despite how useful it is, we still don't know what it is. And, and what Honorbond's shown now with the uh, megahertz and, and gigahertz uh, and terahertz coming out of microtubules, and now he can detect megahertz and gigahertz from the scalp, essentially like EEG, I suspect that's going to fortify the idea that, that EEG is coming from microtubules. Great, great, great talk. Um, uh, I have a question that um, you sort of touched on the answer, but uh, like a little more explanation, it has to do with the ORC part of the ORC OR. If the collapse of the wave function occurs before the conscious experience, how is it that the conscious, the sequence of consciousness makes sense for the individual, and how come it's the same sequence for everybody combined who's sharing that experience? Uh, are you talking about Roger's backward time effects? Well, the, the, if the conscious experience occurs after the collapse, so the collapse occurs randomly, but yet the conscious experience has to make sense and, and occur in a logical order for everyone. So oh. the, if the consciousness is driven by that collapse before the consciousness occurs, my consciousness goes in a logical sequence for me, but if it's right. being driven by an event before, why, how, how does it happen that my sequence of consciousness makes sense and it's making the same sense for you and for me? Okay, well, there's about five questions in there. So first of all, you have to deal with the, uh, the, uh, the binding problem. So if you see something and it, it goes to your uh, V1 and then through associative cortex, up to the front of the brain, shape, color, motion, meaning are all bound together. Uh, so you see one object. Uh, you see a, a blue kite fluttering in the wind. You don't uh, instead of a bird or a plane or something like that. Uh, and and the all the the shape, color, motion, meaning are processed different areas, and at different times. And yet you see one object at one instant. So that's the first problem you have to you and neurology and mainstream neuroscience have to have to figure out before you uh, before you know jumping on my case. But uh, but I think the, the, the experience happens at the time of uh, at, at the time of, of the collapse. Now uh, the problem is that uh, if you process something and then it, so it goes back in the brain, in front of the brain, and then it gets distributed. Three, the, 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 the activity that correlates with conscious experience happens three to 500 milliseconds after sensory impingement, and yet we experience it at the time of the evoked potential at 30 milliseconds. And that goes back to Libet's backward time effect that Roger was talking about. And by the way, there's Libet's backward time effects from 1979, and there's Libet's move your finger experiments, 1983, and Daniel was talking about the move your finger, and Roger was talking about the backward time. That, that sometimes get, gets, gets conflated. But uh, the point is that you get backward time effects so that you have real-time conscious perception even though your brain hasn't processed it yet. And if it weren't for that, nobody could hit a baseball at 95 miles an hour because it'd be in the catcher's mitt by the time you see it. And, and, and tennis and, and even rapid-fire conversation. So there's a lot of problems to deal with and I think this solves, them, solves more than, than uh, create problems. We have one last one back here in the corner. Thanks, Stuart. And up the last point there, number three, you said consciousness depends upon the function of microtubules in the nervous system. So I'm, uh, yesterday, there was a comment that was made that there are special uh, bundling properties of the microtubules in the neuron itself. And so I'm, I'm curious from a point of you know, standing here in this phenomena as a complex anatomy and physiology, has there been any study on the, the structure or nature of the unique quality of microtubules in other organ systems, such as the heart, uh, or say, for example, in the reproductive organ like the womb, for example, right. because part of the challenge that I'm, and curiosity that I'm having is that the, the conference here is still focusing on an anatomy and physiology model of the last couple hundred years that kind of brings our intelligence to our head, where if you look from the history of arts and humanities, kind of consciousness and intelligence is a whole body phenomena that, you know, there's lots of traditions that say the heart is the origin of consciousness or some right. birthing phenomena is the origin of consciousness. Well, the, the heart does have a lot of uh, nerve ganglia and microtubules, and uh, 
Uh, when I did cardiac anesthesia, I remember the heart surgeons talking about that they did a heart transplant on, on some guy, and he came back, and all of a sudden he loved to dance. And they knew that the donor loved to dance. Right. They couldn't publish that, they couldn't talk about it, but that, that shit does happen. And, uh, uh, sorry. But as far as the difference uh, in microtubules, so as I recall, uh, maybe, maybe you guys can correct me, in the brain there's 22 different genetic isoforms of tubulin. So, uh, and, and then there can be five levels of uh, post-translational modification and so forth. So if you think of a microtubule as a, as a lattice, uh, and each tubulin can be in one of those 20, you have a mosaic. So the capacity for memory is, is incredible. And in other tissues, there's only, I think, 10 of the 11, uh, sorry, there's only 11 iso isoforms. And by the way, as far as memory, in, in dendrites, uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, dynamic instability. They're capped at both ends, and uh, the cells don't divide, so they don't have to disassemble and lose all their, uh, the relation, their lattice related. So basically, uh, dendritic microtubules are perfect for memory storage, is the point I was trying to make. And, and last point is, in dendrites, the mixed polarity gives rise to interference, which I think is essential to consciousness, to give you the slower, uh, slower aspects down into the hertz. Okay, everybody, could we get a standing ovation for this man, please? He deserves it, all right? Thank you. Stuart. All right.